Welcome everyone. As people come in, uh, I'll start the uh, introduction and giving you a little information about the Al Wound Jr. Youth Center. Tonight we have our favorite therapist, Kenneth Brown. Uh, and Kenneth is a marriage and family therapist with the Genesis Center. Uh, before we get into talking with Kenneth, and I probably need to give him my insurance card since, you know, I've been having a couple of visits here, but we'll start with uh, the Al Wooten Junior Center. The Al Wooten Junior Center is a nonprofit organized and founded by Myrtle Fay Rump in 1990 in honor of her son killed in a drive-by shooting. The center provides free after school and summer programs for students in grades three to 12 in the South Los Angeles area. The parent power group workshops are presented in partnership with the Green Foundation and other donors, which can be found at www.wootencenter.org slash donors. Our upcoming May power, uh, parent power groups uh, next week will have, have helping families stay connected with Antonio Palacinto Jr. He's a director of LAUSD Parent and Community uh, Engagement uh, Department. And on the 23rd, Making It Through the Tough Times with Wendy Gladly, founder and CEO of For, uh, Forgiving for Living. In regards to our, our sponsor, the Green Foundation, they have quite a few programs and some of the wonderful work they do is with health education and early detection of cancer, uh, cancer education, breast health, and they have an annual health conference. In, a different, in addition to the advocacy work that they do, um, they also have community and, and a faith engagement coalition and uh, they worked on you know, the census and they worked on COVID-19. In regards to COVID-19, um, they have resources, Act Now COVID Help. Um, if you know anyone that needs any services, definitely scan the QR code. Um, the local telephone number is 323-229-3411 or 714-756-0027. So at this time, we'll get back. Okay, come on. We'll get back to Kenneth Brown. Uh, I'm, yes, and I'm gonna stop sharing, Kenneth, so you can start sharing whenever you feel like it. All right, perfect. First of all, thank you for having me back. I really appreciate it. I'm humbled and I'm honored. I think it's a privilege for me to be able to have your ear. And I appreciate you all being completely open to the discussion that we're going to have today. So with that being said, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I love to do that right here. Now, tell me what you all see. Do you see my PowerPoint presentation? We see your PowerPoint presentation. Perfect. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and do uh, from beginning. Perfect. All right. So this is what we're going to do today. I don't know if you all are aware of this, but it's Mental Health Awareness Month. And so... <clears throat> I want to just talk about some mental health basics, and then towards the end of the presentation, I also would like to talk about any type of self-care that um, we can do just to make sure that we're staying healthy and we have a very healthy way of coping with stress. Listen, to be stressed is normal, but it's just how we cope with it. That's where um, it can be uh, like a degree of differences. So that's what we're going to do. Today, this is considered a psychoeducation presentation. In other words, I'm gonna take my clinical background and just try to give you some information to educate us on Mental Health 101, right? And so if at any given time you have questions, I'm the type of presenter, I am very okay with you interrupting me and asking me a question. It doesn't throw me off. Uh, if you wanna type it in the chat, please do so. Uh, we will have somebody monitoring the chat and then we can make sure that we get your questions answered. I'm gonna go through the information. 
there's a couple of videos. I have three videos in here. And as we get to those sections in the presentations, I'll keep a check on time. And if I feel like we don't have time to watch that video, we'll move on. But we'll get there when we get there, okay? All right. So mental health, there's a quote that I found I loved and it was um, anonymous. And it said, don't let your struggle become your identity. When it comes to mental health, I never want anyone to feel like the totality of who they are is defined by the diagnosis they received, right? So I'm just bipolar, or I am just depressed, or I am just a, a general anxiety disorder. We're never that. That's just something we're experiencing, but that doesn't define who we are. So this presentation is really going to be aimed at us being able to kind of navigate the myths. We're going to bust some myths about mental health and talk about some language to use when we're describing someone who might have been diagnosed with a mental health challenge or disorder. So what does mental health mean? Mental health is um, speaking to emotional, psychological, and social well-being. All right. It's talking about how we do what? how we handle, how we handle the stress, how we relate to others, how we make choices, right? That's what mental health does. It impacts all of that. And mental health is a spectrum, right? And there are many factors that contribute to person's mental health, including biological factors. Do you know that oftentimes things are a genetic and it has to do with our brain chemistry, okay? So when we talk about somebody who might be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, the studies are finding that that is an individual who might have been born with a chemical imbalance. It was nothing that they did. It was nothing that the mom did. It was nothing that the dad did. It was something that was inevitable. And not only that, you can live a healthy, successful life with a bipolar disorder diagnosis, okay? And so this is what we want to come. We want to come and take away the stigma that oftentimes can be connected with mental health. And I want to say this, especially in my community, if you look like me, listen, we'll be going to church, we're going to pray it away, and that's fine. There is no competition between theology and psychology. There's a great intersectionality between the two, and I'm here for it. I want you to read scriptures, I want you to go to church, but I also want you to go to therapy, and if you have been diagnosed and you need medication, I want you to be medication compliant. And you can still read, you understand what I'm saying, y'all? It's both. So we're not in competition with each other. But what I love is I have an opportunity to talk to people who look like me, because oftentimes in our community, we can kind of turn and look at mental health and with valid concern, sometimes we can be a little suspicious and it's okay. So I'm here for all of that. I'm here for all of that, okay? This is a safe space. Whatever your opinions are regarding mental health, you're in a safe space. Life experiences can contribute to mental health, such as trauma or abuse. I think this is probably the most, um, most well-known reason as to why a person might be dealing with mental health is because we've been hearing trauma. We're definitely familiar, unfortunately, with uh, physical abuse, child abuse. I work for the Genesee Center. And so the men and women who I have the privilege of working with have experienced domestic violence and they have experienced intimate partner violence. Domestic violence, did you all know, can also be quantified or, or, or defined by, a, by um, an adult parent hitting their kids as adults. We have that. So what, we, what I want you to do is the traditional idea of domestic violence isn't between two people that are in a relationship. It can be family members as well. The point is, is that trauma and abuse, those life experiences can lead to mental health conditions. And then this, lifestyle and life circumstances. Okay. Sometimes it's our diet. Sometimes it's exercise, social support, or opportunities for relaxation. What I mean is, what if you don't have access to this? What if you don't have social support? What if you're so overworked and overrun? Overworked and underpaid, my mama used to say, okay? But you have no opportunity for relaxation. That is going to result in your mental health being taxed. If you have access to, to only processed food, fast foods, how many know? Raise your hand if in our community, we're always dealing with food deserts, okay? There's a Popeye's, there's a McDonald's, there's a Taco Bell, there's a church's chicken, but very rarely do we have restaurants. 
or sometimes a plethora or a lot of grocery stores to choose from. So these are the things that are under the lifestyle and life circumstances category that can lead to poor mental health. Mental health condition is medically referred as any mental illness, any mental behavior or emotional disorder ranging from mild to moderate that impact on one's daily life. So as a clinician, the first thing I wanna gauge is how is your daily functioning being interrupted? And depending on how you answer me, that's going to determine whether it is categorized as mild, moderate, or severe, right? To the point that is interrupting our daily functioning. So something like a general anxiety disorder, depression, eating disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder. We've heard that PTSD a lot in, in social media and on television. Obsessive compulsive disorder. These are just a common a couple of mental health conditions that are diagnosable. A serious mental illness, this is, this is when we talk about a different level, is a mental behavior or emotional disorder resulting in serious functional impairment which substantially interferes with or limits one or may, more major life activities. Now we're talking about schizophrenia, we're talking about bipolar disorder, like I mentioned. We're talking about severe depression or severe obsessive compulsive disorder. So I just kind of want to put that out there that people are dealing or living with a variety of different levels of their mental health and how it's being impacted. Can I also throw in there family and loved ones? They're all being impacted by this as well, right? And we'll get into that a little bit later. So mental health conditions are quite common, yet often unseen. In 2018, 47.6 million adults aged 18 or older reported experiencing mental health conditions at some point during the previous year, right? That's a lot of people. One in five American adults experience a mental health condition every year and one in 25 lives with a serious mental illness. So it's out there, but oftentimes because mental health is invisible, in the, so to speak, right? And let me, let's talk about this. Mental health is different than physical health. How many parents know when their child is sick? What do we start to see? Droopy eyes. We see um, a loss of appetite, sneezing, coughing, nasal drip right? Uh, there's just this, this um, irritability, short patience. Not, no, so what we're seeing is a physical symptoms of a disease or, or a sickness or a virus. What happens is when a person is dealing with depression and if it's mild, you may not see that right away. So it's re we're really good as humans with jumping in and dealing with our physical health because it, it shows up different than our mental health. Now, the effects of mental health conditions, for nearly 40 years, mental health conditions have been the second most common cause of disability in the United States. 70% of those diagnosed with a mental health condition also experience a comorbid illness, such as obesity and diabetes, and in higher rates than in general population. So what do I mean by comorbidity? Oftentimes, let's say a person who may be diagnosed with depression might also be diagnosed with obesity or diabetes. That's what this slide is saying. And oftentimes, anybody who's diagnosed with a mental health condition, what they're saying is 70% 70, 70 of those people often have a second thing that's going on. All right, so I want to make sure this slide makes sense. So out of that, if we go back to the previous slides, we're talking about 48 million, 47.6 million people have experienced some type of mental health condition. Of those 40-something million, 70% of them are also dealing with another thing. So there's usually two connected. Here's why I want to look at this slide. If we start at the bottom of the slide and we look at the orange part where it says personal, now we're going to kind of go up and extend out right? If you're dealing with a mental health disorder, you're at an increased risk 
of a disease, a chronic disease as well. In other words, my mental health is also connected to my physical health and vice versa, to be honest with you. And so what this slide is saying that oftentimes people with a diagnosed mental health disorder are gonna be prone to be dealing with some, and that's what the other slide was saying, talking about obesity or high blood pressure, other things are starting to manifest. 19% of those people with the mental health issue also usually have a substance misuse issue. Why do you think that is? Why would it be that if I have a mental health disorder, why would 19% of those people be struggling with a substance abuse disorder? Anybody wanna just throw it out there real quick? It seems like it would be hard to regulate yourself and uh, substance abuse, sometimes people try to medicate themselves. Oh, you hit it out the park. You hit it out the park. That's, that's really what it is. Because remember, and, and we look at it as a strength, by the way. As a clinician, I'm not coming in here to shame you. If you're struggling with your mental health, and you pick up some, some marijuana or some edibles, I'm not going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe you're doing that. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to praise you for trying to regulate, but this is what I'm going to do as a therapist. I'm going to say, so, so that's what's in your toolbox. Let me give you some more tools to add so that you're not dependent on that one thing. And here's why. Because if you're also looking for employment, remember marijuana is still illegal federally, and I need you to go to your job interview and succeed. So if you're depressed, I understand why you're using the marijuana, but we got to get you off of that because you still need a job. And that THC is going to show up in your blood. It's going to show up in your urine or it'll show up in your hair. And now you're not going to get a job and you're going to continue to be depressed. Do you understand what I'm saying? So my job as a clinician is not to shame somebody for their coping mechanism, but I want to move them from that to a healthier coping mechanism. So the next time I'm stressed, I might journal. The next time I'm dealing with depression, who's in my village that I can go to and talk to? And we would have a conversation about identifying what works best with you. But that's what that's saying right there. And you hit it right out the park, Miss. When people are dealing with a mental health issue, they're trying to self-medicate. They're trying to self-soothe. So that's why you would see that substance misuse show up. Family, at least 8.4 million Americans care for a loved one with mental or emotional health issues. That's what I was alluding to earlier. So now we're talking about what started with me is now impacting everybody else. Because I want to make sure, and this is what we hope, is that if I am diagnosed with bipolar disorder and I have an episode, that you understand and that you can care for me appropriately without shaming me. But that, does, that takes a toll on it because now everybody's involved in your treatment and everybody's involved in helping you be the best that you can be. That's what that lighter orange is talking about. Guess what? 15 to 23% of children live with a parent with a mental health condition. So now those kids are being impacted by that as well. So it's definitely something that is starting, as you can see, it's going out. What started as personal, everyone is starting to be impacted by this. The next thing we're going to look at is the community. 20% of people experiencing homelessness also have a serious mental illness. Remember, it's interrupting your daily functioning to be able to do what you need to do. And my heart goes out oftentimes to people who are homeless because, as you know, in Los Angeles, we're dealing with a homeless crisis and have been for quite some time. But another component that, of course, we want our elected officials to look at is we got to have a mental health component. It's not just about sometimes finances. Okay, there we go. Can y'all hear me now? All right. So sometimes we, we just need to think about all of that. One in eight U.S. emergency department visits are related to mental and substance use disorders. And now let's look at the world. Depression and anxiety cost the global economy one trillion each year in lost productivity. Leave it to a capitalist society to be worried about work, <laughs> right? But that's just a part of it, right? So if I'm calling out because I'm dealing with some things, it's just going to impact everything, right? So that's what this slide is about, how it starts personal and it goes out towards uh, family, community, and then on a global scale. And, and Ken, we haven't even 
begun to get the data regarding you know the pandemic that started in 2020 and 2021 because we're still looking at 2019 data Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and individually we can tell you know we just feel it that things have gotten a little bit more out of control yes i'm so glad you brought that up because remember like you said the idea of us going through this global pandemic has impacted the entire world period and we're still dealing with an economy that's reeling and trying to get back on track as a result of the mass exodus from the workforce. Everybody had to stay home. And now we're dealing with how do we get people back? And even, you know, people going to the movies or going shopping or just getting out, getting out more and more. Now, obviously people are out, but we're still dealing with the impact of having none of that being active. And then guess what? Dealing with being at home with your loved ones who are then suffering with mental health conditions, right? I know at the Genesee Center, we saw an increase in intimate partner violence and domestic violence because that individual was pretty much stuck at home with the abuser. We also saw an increase of that with general neglect and abuse with kids, elderly abuse. Everything just went up because everyone was stuck in that space with those abusers. So it's it's quite profound. And the fact that we're here is great, but we're going to have to really contend and deal with all of what that means and how it's still showing up. And like you said, Ms. the data is still coming in. So thank you for that. That was great. Please jump in. I invite you. If there's something you want to say, if there's something that gets you excited, you want to comment, I invite you to come and say something. You don't feel like you have to wait. I appreciate it. Let's do this. Let's go ahead and watch a little bit of this. Tell me if you can hear it. You need to turn it up. I can hear it. Okay. My volume is up on my end as loud as it would go. Can you all hear that video? No, you can't hear it at all? No. Oh, I know what I didn't do. I didn't do share sound. Watch this. Ooh, I'm learning, y'all. <laughs> there we go. I'm learning. Can I tell y'all? It is 2022 and I'm still, I'm still learning how to do Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do this. I'm going to test it right now. Now you should really hear it. I was strapped down in a gurney in an yeah, ambulance. Perfect. perfect. So my mind is flying. Okay, watch this. I'm going to go back. Bipolar. I thought everyone was in on it. I just want to run. It's almost you. I thought everyone was in on it. I see signs. See signs. So I'd be in the library looking for clues, looking for symbols, getting to a desk, scratching things down. So when I found my way to um, the community church, sort of climbed the church, I took my clothes off, and all I wanted to do was calm my brain. And then the next thing I knew, I was strapped down in a gurney in an ambulance. So my mind is flying. Bipolar one disorder, manias, hard times. After the mania comes a depression. I don't think you can explain it to someone who doesn't have a mental illness or who hasn't experienced it. You're as low as you can go. It's a very dark place. It's suffocating because there's no break from it, not even for like five minutes. I think the deeper you fall into the depression, the more hopeless you get. So it's a dangerous thing because suicide enters your mind. I had my first manic episode when I was 16. I had a second in 2001. I had a third in 2003, a fourth in 2004. It culminated in going to a rehab facility, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I made a vow to take my meds, which I never broke. I got my life back together. 
met a girl, got married, had a kid, and it was great. It was nine years of peace. When I'm healthy, meaning not in a mania or depression, I'm completely functional. You sort of put your uh, bipolar coat into the closet. It's not affecting you in any way. That's why it was so surprising that something happened after that. I don't think you ever start to feel the mania come on. It's just sort of starts. You trick your mind into thinking you're okay. What's happening feels right. You're doing creative things. You don't want that to end. It kept climbing. You reach a point of psychosis. You've totally lost grip with reality and it's scary. An interesting thing about this last manic episode was that I had stayed on my medication. So I didn't think in my head that if I took my medication, it could ever happen again. What I learned was that I'm not in control of it. I have to surrender that it might happen again. So how I channel this creative energy that uh, bipolar provides, I channel it into my writing. I have probably 50 notebooks. Some are from when I was manic and I'm just scribbling things down and in arrows and symbols and whatnot. Others are more concise when I'm stable and I'm planning out the books. I've written two books and I'm working on the third one now. And the main character has bipolar. My books are fuller, they're richer, there's more to them because of experiences I've had in the past. I feel like I can help people struggling with it right now. You just make a vow that you will never commit suicide. Because if you don't, I can promise you, you'll rise up again. If I could go back in time and not have bipolar disorder, I wouldn't take it. Thank you for sharing, for, for listening. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a window into a person who's living with it, because that's going to be a lot more powerful than me being on the outside narrating about it. So anytime I have an opportunity, we like to call them guest speakers and pull them into this presentation just to give you that authentic understanding and perspective of what it's like. That's what it is. In that video, we saw a couple of things. We saw a person who was living with bipolar disorder, but still at the same time was going through the ebb and flow of it. He had his mountaintop experiences and then he found himself in the valleys a couple of times. But what we do know is that he's still moving forward, making progress, fulfilling relationship, parenting, raising a child, and is really making it happen. And not only that, did you hear how he said during his mania, he's writing? And as a result, he's been able to write a few books. So you can find ways to channel what's going on with us and then use it. Only about 43% of American adults with mental health conditions and 64% of adults with serious mental illness receive treatment. Isn't that crazy? And what would be the reason why someone doesn't receive treatment? They either have poor insurance, poor insurance coverage or no insurance at all, limited access to healthcare providers, or there's some type of attitude factors that we got to consider. Where a person, well, I can handle this on my own. Or strong people don't need help, right? Or the stigma that is associated with mental health, whereby people are like, I know them doctors is crazy just like me. They don't know no more than me. Right. And so we adopt these different attitudes about mental health. And so therefore, that could be the reason why people don't get treatment. Discussing mental health issues can sometimes be tough with providers. Right. It's this is where we need our providers to understand the personal the personal stigma that a person brings into the room. Right. You got to be willing to talk about your lack of mental health knowledge or having the confidence to talk about it. Not to mention unfamiliarity with cultural or religious norms, right? And sometimes we need to be able to differentiate between what is a cultural norm versus something that might be connected with mental health. Differing views on how we collaborate. All of that can be kind of the whole story. Okay, so this is what we do know. People with a serious mental illness are violent and unstable. 
The truth is only three to 5% of violent acts can be attributed to individuals living with a serious mental illness. People with serious mental illness are over 10 times more likely to be victims of violent crime than the general population. Isn't that interesting? Right, because I used to think, oh, they are crazy. They are gonna turn around. That's not always the case. Racism, hate, and domestic disputes are far more reliable and frequent indicators of violence than mental health issues. Once you're diagnosed with a mental health condition, you'll never, you'll never get over it. The truth is, just like with physical illness, such as diabetes or asthma, mental health conditions can be successfully treated and managed. So recovery or that process in which people are able to live, work, learn, participate in their communities, it of course is unique for everybody. So there's never a cookie cutter solution. But I wanna say with confidence that with medication, with therapy, even possible lifestyle changes with group support, you'll be fine. We can lead a, a very healthy life. People with mental health conditions aren't productive, employees, and can't handle the stress of a job. Truth is, when people with mental health conditions receive the proper treatment and symptom management, they can be as effective on the job as those without diagnosed mental health issues. We're busting some myths right here, y'all. Now I want to hear from Kiki Palmer. Y'all, please sit back. I love her. Listen to this. She got me excited. Listen to her. So we were backstage at What Happens Live. Yes. And, you know, the show's great. We're partying Oh, my it gosh, up. so fun, yeah. But when we went backstage, you started talking to me about some deeper stuff happening in your yeah. life. Yeah. Some of the anxieties you'd been through. You talked about depression a little bit. Yeah. When did that all start? Um, I think when I first started noticing that I, like, had anxiety or that something was... You know, I wanted to start searching for ways to describe how I was feeling because I couldn't really express them. I had no labeling for what I felt when I was around um, probably like 15, 14, 15, 16. You know, like those ages is when I really started looking up for ways to describe what I felt. And the words I came across were stress, anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, and depression. So the child acting you were doing, which you started around age nine, right? Yeah, uh-huh. How did that play into this? Um, I think when the way that the entertainment industry played into the way that I felt, um, aside from just, you know, maybe those things just being kind of a part of life, was the fact that I was not always able to feel like I was okay to be myself, yeah. trying to, having pressure, trying to uh, continue to feel, you know, this personality or idea that people had to me, had of me. That was really uh, hard for me um, growing up. Uh, the word breakdown comes up, the time when you sort of, yeah. Hit the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I was 17, that was the first time I had told my parents, like, I really want to go to a therapist. You know, I'd done some research. And again, coming from where I come from, these aren't things that people are openly talking about. You know, I come from Robbins, Illinois, which is like a very small town. It just got a gas station a couple years ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's a very, very small town. And so when you're, you know, depressed, you're lazy. You know, when you're angry, you know, you, you, it's not because you've experienced trauma and you don't know how to express yourself. It's just you're a bad person. Yeah. So I never had a way to describe these things. And so once I finally realized what was going on, I said, okay, I just need to talk to somebody. But what happened that made you feel like you're out of sorts? Was there a moment you realized, I got to turn this around. It's not going the right way. Um, yes, probably. I think it was just a, a, a point I'd hit with my parents and realizing that there was no way I could really communicate with them any longer what I was experiencing and I needed to get outside, I need to get outside of that, outside of my family structure to really understand the problems that I was going through. One of the beautiful things about you, and I've learned a lot about you over the last few weeks, and this is her book by the way, it's called I Don't Belong to You. Uh, and when I read this, I actually got fairly emotional thinking about how mature you'd become mm -hmm. in your very, how old are you now? I'm 23. That's right, 23. It's not written the way a 23-year-old, I would think, would write a book. Uh -huh. Now, parts of it are, obviously, you got emojis and all kinds of hashtags <laughs> and uh, the gag is and yes! the bay. I'm getting all these words now. <laughs> it's like, I got a whole glossary of things I got in the back of the book here to keep up with you. I love but it. But the profound insights about the struggles that you were experiencing are there because you struggled with them. Yeah. And I'm just going to quote a little thing here. It says, uh, I did not spread my wings because I was told I couldn't fly a certain way and I believed it. Yeah. Now, how did that affect you? Oh, that is the story I feel of life. It makes me emotional a little bit because, you know, that's, I, I, 
that is what we all go through. You know, when I came into the industry so young, and especially, specifically in that, I was talking about the music industry. I came in so young, singing in church, and I really allowed the, inter the industry to make me feel, because my mom and me wouldn't let them exploit me, that I couldn't be a musician, that it was not for me. I really allowed them to steal my joy and love for something right from under me. And that was the biggest heartbreak, you know, of my life, was turning my back on music because of what people said to me. You know, it was very hard for me. What were they saying to you that made you think you couldn't do it? You know, it was just the overall voices that I kept hearing from different people. And they would say, you know, you, you know your career is just mainly with acting, you know, or, you know, this is not what your fans really want. And, you know, you can't really do R&B music, you know, but it was about telling my story for me. Music was about telling my story. It was not about making billions of dollars. It was about being able to say, yo, this is where I came from, and this is where I'm going, you know, and this is, this is the sound I grew up with. You know, I come from Chicago and R&B, jazz. That's my, my, my thing. Yeah. There was a, a part of the book where you talk about this fight you were having with the record industry. Yeah. And you say, it's not about selling singles. It's about people understanding who I am. Right. Why do, is that message so hard to deliver? Because I think people like to put out facade in the entertainment industry of perfection, of glossiness, and that's just not who Kiki Palmer is. You know, I came from the hood, and that's the beautiful thing. And I don't want to hide that from other little girls that are from the hood. I want them to see me up here with you and say that they can do it. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. Oh. I love that. I don't get tired of watching that channel. And th the reason is because, again, we get to hear from someone. Did y'all hear what she said? She was already identifying at 14, 15, like something's not right. And as she has access to social media with her generation, she's looking up words to help her to describe how she's feeling. And words that came up were stress, depression, anxiety. Do you know one of my jobs as a clinician is to give my clients emotional vocabulary? Oftentimes we grow up and we don't even know how to describe how we're feeling. And so I'll use what's called a feeling wheel. So if I'm working, especially with our boys, our boys oftentimes are socialized in a way that they don't have access to their emotions, right? The little boy falls down, get up, you'll be all right. You just use cry. Boys don't cry. Scrape it, be all right, you keep it. You know, and when our girls fall down, oh, we scoop them up and we cut it. Oh, you go, you, right? And so what happens over time is that they don't have access to emotional vocabulary. So a boy's like, I'm mad. You know, it may not have been anger. It might've been embarrassment. It might've been shame. And so it manifests as anger. And so what I love that I keyed in on, she was already trying to help herself identify what's going on with me. And to the point where time she got to 17, she told her parents, I need to go to therapy. That's powerful in and of itself. So as a therapist, I have a bias. So I was super excited to hear that. But more importantly, I just want to, again, give you a window into somebody else's experience. And what we know is that mental health conditions are no respecter of person. Doesn't matter your national nationality. Doesn't matter your, your economic status, social economic status. Doesn't matter. None of that matters. Stress is stress. The stressors that we all experience as humans, not as celebrities, not as rich or poor or middle class, lower. What do we experience as humans is what we're seeing today play out, which is why it does not matter your background. Bipolar is bipolar. Depression is depression. We can have different reasons as the source as to why we have arrived at that conclusion. But what we do know is the human experience is universal. So communication counts, right? By, by us communicating more thoughtfully about mental health conditions, we can reduce the stigma, the stereotypes, and some of the discriminatory behavior against people that are experiencing mental health conditions. We can help people recognize symptoms of mental health conditions in themselves and others. Remember what I was saying earlier, how we're really good at helping somebody know they have a cold? We could be at work. Oh, you sound like you might have a cold. <laughs> it sounds like you sick. You should have stayed home. We don't do that with bipolar, but we could. We don't do that with depression, but we could. And here's how. I noticed that your mood is, are you okay? What's going on? You want to talk about it? 
Why would we say that? Because we're becoming more adept at what depression looks like, just like we know what a flu looks like. We can check in with our loved ones and we can say, hmm, are you okay? You seem like you might be under a lot of stress. What can I do? You see what I'm saying? The way we look at colds, flus, and we're able to assess our friends, just like you don't have to be a doctor and we be on it. Oh, uh, put, put a jacket on. I want you to catch cold. What if we told our friends, okay, what are you doing for self-care? Because you had a stressful week. That's the same as putting a jacket on. When we tell our kids to put a jacket on because we don't want them to catch a cold, we tell our friends, I need you to do something for self-care this weekend because you had a very stressful week. That's the same as putting a jacket on. Why? Because the jacket is a preventable measure before the cold comes. When you do a self-care activity, that lets some of the steam out the pot before you experience an episode, right? And so I just want us to take a look at mental health the same way we look at physical health so that we can do what? Increase the rate that people will seek treatment, improve mental health care for people who receive it when they do seek help. We want to avoid some things and we want to replace them, right? And a lot of this has to do with culture, sometimes has to do with how we were raised, what era we was raised in, but we want to avoid saying, that's crazy, they cycle, they insane. And instead things like, you know, well, that's a little odd. That behavior might be a little bizarre. Oh, she's schizophrenic. No, she has been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. In other words, she's not her diagnosis. That's something she's experiencing, but that's not the totality of who she is. Oh, he bipolar. Oh, you know, Craig, the bipolar one. Uh-uh, we be at church. Uh-uh, that's the bipolar. You know she got them bipolar kids. No, 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 no. Taking away, right, the stigma. He's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Substance abuse, addict. This is something I learned substance use disorder, substance misuse. We're move, we definitely don't want to say crackhead. <laughs> oh my God, I heard crackhead growing up. Them crackheads by the, and sitting up by the liquor. Oh, them ain't them, but you better watch out, you're gonna become a crackhead, right? This is what our parents used to tell us. My uncles, my aunts, my cousins. And what happens is it takes away from the validity of what that person really might be experiencing as to why they're sitting in front of that liquor store. What we're trying to do is increase our empathy and come from a place where we can go, you know what? They're dealing with some stuff. Oh, they suffering from mental illness or they're living with, experiencing mental illness, mental health conditions. Successful suicide or she commit or he committed suicide. Unfortunately, they died by suicide. They died by suicide. Right. So this is some language. And I don't expect any of us to be experts. And I don't expect us to leave this presentation and you're going to have all this memorized and none of us are going to make any mistakes. That's not the expectation. But it's just dropping a seed today so that we begin to think about mental health different. So please don't put any unrealistic expectations on ourselves and we will still make mistakes with the language. It's changing. That's all. As we become more sensitive and empathetic, then that's why these this language changes. That's all. We're just, when we know better, we do better, right? We're not about to sit here and, and, and villainize ourselves or our parents. When we know better, we do better. So what you see on this slide is a reflection of feedback from people that have been dealing with this. This is how I felt when they said that. And so all of this causes everybody in the profession to take a look at how do we get the most optimal response from our people. We want them to have positive treatment outcomes. And if that means I got to say uh, uh, substance use disorder instead of addict, so be it. Because I want you to succeed. We want to avoid trivialization, right? Even on Twitter and stuff, people be saying all kinds of stuff. And that was this slide is talking about. 
In 2019, a study of 1,300 tweets found that mental illnesses were more stigmatized and trivialized than physical illnesses. Because again, we kind of got physical illnesses under control. But, oh, I have so much OCD when it comes to notifications on my phone. You know how we just, re we just reduce that entire diagnosis to a trivial afterthought. Whereas the person who is really dealing with obsessive compulsive disorder, if they were to hear that, they'd be like, that's not what that is. You don't understand where I'm coming from. You don't understand. You just trivialized it to something so small. I'm guilty of it. I, I got some OCD tendencies. I need to have my room clean. You know, we say these things and we don't know how it may impact someone who really is dealing with that diagnosis. That's what they're saying right here. Oh, I wish I had anorexia. I can lose this weight. Always stuff. I've heard my family say stuff like that, especially around Thanksgiving time. Uh-uh, I'm worried I'm against anorexia. I'm going to lose all the it's that kind of thing where we're being comical, but in fact, we're trivializing a real, real, real mental health challenge for somebody that's dealing with anorexia. Okay, this last video, there's one expletive. Ms. Taraji drops, she drops one expletive. But here's what I say. The content of what she's saying totally outweighs the one curse word. So I hope you agree. The content of everything is so good that it definitely, but I always like to tell people, don't be shocked. There's one expletive. It's going to be in there somewhere. What I find disturbing in our community, the African-American community, is that we can talk about a thyroid, we can talk about cancer, breast cancer, AIDS even, but we won't deal with the mental. And that's an issue. I struggle with depression and anxiety. I would have to say I realized it. If everyone could put your name and your zip code in the chat, we would greatly appreciate that. And Ken will be back in just a second. And we do see the um, questions in the chat and we will uh, answer that before the end of the session. Is that to everyone or to Wooten Center or Lawrence? Oh, it's everyone. Everyone uh, put your name and zip code in the chat. Okay, thank you. thank you. Can you unmute? I think Kim may have had the same problems I had a couple of weeks ago. I'm I, so sorry. I'm back. I couldn't find myself to unmute myself. I, oh my yeah, gosh. I, no problem, <laughs> Kim. Okay. We're going to do this.
you know, sometimes the technology of it, uh, it challenges us. But we yeah. definitely, we have a, a, a couple of questions in the chat. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Are you guys not seeing the video play? No. Oh my gosh. Okay, let me stop that. Now, you know what? Let me stop that. Okay. I apologize about that. All right. No so let's go right back to just us. Basically, what Taraji was going to do was to talk about her own bouts with mental health, just as much as Kiki Palmer did. Again, I wanted to give you an insight to someone else. But yes, let's take our remaining time to talk and have a discussion to answer any questions. What we got in the chat? Uh, in the chat, uh, and we'll go up here. Oh, I see. Uh, Kelly asked, what is considered a serious mental health condition? Mm -hmm. So that's a really great question. Oh, in the realm of therapists, there are a couple of conditions. And here's the thing. I want to be very clear when I say this. Obviously, anything that anyone is experiencing, we, we consider it serious. But if we had to come up with a way to quantify it, we're talking about schizophrenia. We're talking about bipolar disorder. Those disorders that require oftentimes medical assistance to help the person find balance and find healing, right? There's general, ang ang general anxiety disorder. There's depression, major depressive disorder, severe to the point to where you're not taking care of your kids. No one's taking them to school in the morning. No one's helping them get dressed. We're talking about that severe. Why? Because at the level at which it's impacting your ability to do life. Always think about how much is this mental health condition impacting my ability to function as a human being? That's the first thing I'm concerned about, safety. Do we have suicidal ide ideations, we call it? Ideas of taking one's own life? due to the mental health condition, that's when we're like, okay, right? So one person who may be dealing with mild depression versus a person who's dealing with severe depression, that's where we kind of talk about, you know, mental health conditions that are serious. We're going to take all of it serious, but obviously the mental health condition that is impacting one's ability to function at a greater capacity, that's the one we really need to focus on. And so those with the serious mental issues, would those require a psychiatrist over a psychologist? Ooh, good question. Let's talk about the difference between psychiatry and psychology. The psychologist has the ability to perform testing. Have you ever watched a movie or heard someone say, my uh, client is not competent to stand trial? That's a psychologist. Only a licensed psychologist can say that another person is competent or incompetent to stand trial. And so oftentimes a psychologist will be interfacing with the law, with that whole, with lawyers, everybody, they have to come to court and trust me and believe when they give that test to an individual, they will come under cross-examination. How did you arrive at that? What did you say? So the psychologist has the ability to do tests. The psychologist goes into the schools. They do intelligence tests with both adults and with children. So the psychologist, when you think psychologists think test, as a therapist, I cannot test. I can diagnose you, but I can't test. There's certain tests I can do, um, a mental status exam, what, who's the president? What's your name? What's today's date? Those type of things, because I need to kind of figure out where you're at with your cognition. But as far as those tests that really are deep and have, consequential consequences as a result of how you test, that's a psychologist. The psychiatrist is a doctor. The psychiatrist went to school, they went to medical school. The psychiatrist is now gonna take pharmacology and psychology and intersect the two. As a therapist, I'm gonna refer you out to a psychologist if I feel like you need to be tested and a psychiatrist who's gonna now do the medication. The psychiatrist is going to sit down and tell you, okay, due to the fact that you might have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, 
based off of your weight, your height, I can tell you what medication you need and how much. The psychiatrist is gonna ask you in your sessions, how is your appetite? How, is you, how are you sleeping? What has your mood been like now that I have prescribed this medicine to you? And then you will still see me, the therapist, because I'm gonna help you deal with what does it mean to live with this diagnosis? How is it impacting your relationships? How is it impacting you parenting? How is it impacting you and your job? I'm gonna be there with you throughout, but I'm not gonna be able to help you with manage the medicine. You'll meet with your psychiatrist once a month to go over medication management, but you'll meet with me once a week to do therapy. Thank you. The great questions, I love it. Um, I see, is there a school of thought professionals have about people disclosing their mental conditions to others? So remember this, there's a level of confidentiality that exists between me and my client. But the client has the right to tell whoever they want about whatever they want. Now, I would say this. The whole point, or one of, I think, the powerful takeaways from this is that all of us in this group, we get to walk away. And hopefully our idea of mental health has changed a little bit so that we can take some of the stigma away with it. So if a person were to disclose to someone that they're dealing with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, of course, they're opening themselves up to deal with people's biases about it, right? But I don't think there's anything wrong about disclosing. But my question would be, who are you disclosing it to and what would be your motive or your reason for it, right? Who are, what, what, you know, I, and so I'm gonna work through those conversations with the person. Who are they disclosing to? What makes you wanna disclose it? You know, is that a safe space for you to do so? Is your environment, you know, there's all kind of HR laws. They're not supposed to be talking about any of that stuff. But at the same time, you as an employee get to disclose how much of your personal medical history you get to, you understand what I'm saying? The only time it starts to change is when we talk about people who have certain jobs, when you work in the air traffic controllers right? You're literally in charge of those souls that are on those planes. And so they have very different standards about certain things. If you have a diagnosis, I will tell you this, as a therapist, if we diagnose someone with schizophrenia or bipolar, there's certain jobs they can't have. So there is disclosure. You can't go into military with certain diagnoses. So we have to be very careful about what we put on someone because it is going to have long lasting implications. So yes, in some regards, disclosure is quite, is mandated, be, depending on what type of role you're playing in society. We know that the president of the United States has to undergo a health test. To what extent they're honest about it, that's a whole nother conversation. But we do know as the electors, we have a right to elect someone based off of how healthy they are. That's our choice, which is why the precedent has been, you're supposed to release I have a good clean bill of health. I'm able to execute the office of president of the United States. Why? Because this person has validated that I am indeed healthy. That's our right. We know JFK was dealing with all kinds of stuff. He was under all kinds of meds, but we didn't find out until afterwards. Same with Roosevelt. He was in a wheelchair all the time. You know, So sometimes history plays out and they keep that stuff hidden, but we're supposed to know. These are great questions. How did y'all feel about the presentation? Was this, this was my first time, this is my second time presenting this. I thought it was very informative. Um, I have a, a, my best friend, um, he has bipolar. He's very honest about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've known for the past 40 years. And, and, and there's certain checks that we go through on a, 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 a weekly basis, you know, that he'll call and say, okay, I got up and did this. And mm -hmm, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's part of kind of what we do to kind of keep moving forward. So mm -hmm. understanding, understanding it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, uh, is, is really good, you know what I mean? Because you understand what someone is going through. So I, I thought it was really uh, enlightening 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have a, a way of presenting it that makes it very uh, approachable. Uh, oh. I'm going to have to show my son uh, the tape of it because, you know, Kiki Palmer says he thinks it's his girlfriend. <laughs> and I saw Akilah and B about 300 times. So, uh, <laughs> Listen, I love it. I love it. Tell him if it ever was meant to be, she sounds like a healthy human being. (laughs) I mean, these are the things that we need to look for when we're talking about partners, right? I want somebody who's completely aware of their mental health and what they want to do to take care of it, just as much as we take vitamins, elderberry this and Ganesha this and ginkgo bobo. And like, you know, we go through these, what I call trendy vitamins. Every once there's a trendy vitamin, everybody's taking well, again, we as humans are really good about taking care of our physical health. I, as a therapist, have a bias. I'll be very honest. And I want us to be as proactive as taking care of our mental health. I talked to my staff today at work. We have a payday, right, on past Friday. I said, you have to buy something nice for yourself. You worked too hard. Take something out of that paycheck and treat yourself. I'm not telling you to go to Vegas and stay at the Luxor. I'm telling you to get yourself a cup of coffee buy those pair of shoes. But, and they're like, oh, I need you to tell my husband. You know, it's that kind of stuff when we laugh about it. But the reality is you work too hard not to reward yourself for something. You earn that check. So why wouldn't you buy every check? You have to buy yourself something. You get to decide how expensive that something is. But what I'm trying to instill in them is the practice of self-care. You deserve it. And if no one else is going to do it, it has to be you. So self-care can't be a thing that we do. It needs to be a lifestyle that we do. And before we go, I got a a direct question. Okay. And uh, the question is, what if you have an adult child with a mental health issue who won't accept it? Any recommendations? So that's such a powerful question. We don't have the ability to mandate anyone to go to treatment. We can't even make you go to the hospital. It has to be safety. Your safety is at risk. The safety of others is at risk. And and, and they're very strict about that. They just won't put someone in. The only thing that immediately comes to mind for me when talking to this person is being able to show them media, whether it's videos, about what you're seeing in them so that they can see it reflected back at them. Sometimes when you're in the middle of it, obviously it could be because it's they're in a stage of denial and they know it, but not willing and ready to accept it. I also feel that it's a community approach. And so being able to drop little gems about For example, how are you feeling today doing check-ins and you're having this conversation with the individual and given whatever the mental health predicament condition is, trying to find ways to, what's the the word I'm going to use? To say it in a way that's not condescending or belittling, but just to be able to say, and it's an I statement, I... I I feel really bad or I feel really hurt when you do this. In other words, it's not about them. Oftentimes in communication, we try to get away from blaming. We want to own the feeling ourselves versus you make me sick and and I can't stand when you. I feel really hurt when you talk to me a certain way. So if we own it first and we deflect it off of them and we're using I statements, we know that something's there. But in order to get them to the table, Remember, we're trying to get them to the table. You win more with honey than you do with vinegar. So you can't get them to treatment when your frustration and our, you know, all of that's coming out, which is valid. So you got to do a moment where you calm down and you make it about the I statements and then bringing it back to that. That's the first thing that I would say. Obviously, with a little bit more detail about what it is that they might be seeing, we could come up with some more personalized things. But I would start with me first. Can I, t- can I just talk to you a little bit? When you do so-and-so, I feel, or I, and, and bring it back to you. Because at the end of the day, oftentimes people don't want to hurt each other. 
They're not looking to be malicious in any way. And so if the relationship is healthy and you come from you and you tie it, maybe I do need to see a doctor. Maybe I do need to go see a therapist, you know, because they're constantly thinking about how and whatever their behavior is might be impacting you in a negative way. And they don't want to do that on purpose. I hope that was helpful. Yes. Well, we really want to thank you. And also, we want to let everyone know that we are recording this. So there will be a YouTube link. So this is an opportunity to share with some people that may need it. There you go. Use me. Use this video. Hey, watch this, baby. <laughs> Alberta wanted you. Blame it on me. Alberta said. Blame it on me. I'm making <laughs> some dinner and watch this with me. <laughs> yes. So we we truly appreciate you. You, you know, it's uh, we're getting a little past a seven. So, yes. you know, because we'll take up all your time. You know how you know how we are. No. And I want to be respectful of y'all because y'all know I'll talk. So uh -uh, cut me off. Oh. So we truly appreciate this. Definitely uh, uh, doing a mental health month. We definitely have uh, more of a sense of appreciation. And uh, like we talked about earlier, uh, we can feel that the numbers have increased since the pandemic because everybody seems like they are on a short fuse. So uh, this is definitely great information to have. And, you know, we'll track you down later, Ken, because we truly appreciate you um, that uh, we had Ken around the holidays. And if you hadn't seen those YouTube videos, uh, I would definitely recommend because that was definitely a great thing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, when he first came on, we were talking about summer. So we're all <laughs> trying to get into our summer mode. Our That's summer right. Mode, That's right. Our sum summer mental space. That's so, right. So we're working on that lot too. But uh, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we'll be here next week. Uh, and we're talking about a school engagement. And believe it or not, mental health has a lot to do with that too. Uh, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, there's a lot of my parents out here. So, so we, <laughs> we, we, know, we know the story. So uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thanks, everyone, for coming on.